Good morning. My name is Vanessa, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to the APM Global Community Webcast. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. Thank you. I will now like to turn the call over to Mr. Manish Parikh, Community Board President. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, Vanessa. Good morning, everyone, and a very, very happy new year to you all. Hope you guys have a great holiday season, and um, I know I'm sure it sucks to get back in the swing of things, but uh, welcome back. Uh, today is January 15, 2015. Um, as Vanessa said, I'm Manish Parikh, uh, President of APM Global Youth Community. Joining me today is Keith Palmer, the Vice President. Today, um, um, joining us is the presenter Paul Ellis uh, from Park Marketing Team and Super Carr, a director from Strong Loop, a strategic CA partner. And um, last but not the least, our community managers. Melissa Potvin and Melanie Giuliani, who do a great job handling our community operations. Um, just a few quick announcements. Um, starting 2015, we have decided to kind of um, shift over to, as far as raffle winners, to, uh, to get CA goodies instead of the um, $100 gift card. We experienced last year that we had a lot of discrepancies and on accepting uh, financial gifts for a lot of our uh, winners. So we just kind of are trying to do try a couple of new ideas. So we're going to start off um, giving away CA goodies as one lucky winner. Um, as far as the rules as goes, as you all know, you must be a member um, and cannot be a CA employee. And, you know, be allowed by your employer to receive gifts. Uh, as per your policy. Um, the raffle is sponsored by our community. And uh, I wanted to congratulate Jeff. I'm not sure, I'm going to butcher his last name, but Lokovic. Uh, he won, he was lucky winner from a December uh, raffle. Um, just a few reminders. Um, I don't know if you guys have all checked out the, our new uh, APM developer community, but if you have not, Please do so. Um, it's a great resource for you guys to gain a lot of knowledge um, on some, you know, customized solution. Um, our next event in February will be our office hours. Uh, this is an opportunity you will get to chat with all of your um, questions with uh, CA support. It's scheduled for February 10th, and we'll send out more details as we come along. Um, one more thing is um, during the webcast, if you have questions, please ask in the Q&A panel in the WebEx and not in the chat window. Um, the presentation, I'm assuming, will take from around 45 minutes or so, and then we'll open it up to audio questions. Um, but we will also get to your Q&A uh, within the WebEx, so please be patient. Um, we appreciate all the activity on message boards. Thank you to all of you. Uh, now, now I'm going to hand it over to Paul Ellis. He is with the uh, CAAP marketing team. Thanks, Manish. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce uh, Shubhar Kar, our guest speaker today. He's Director of Products and Education at Strong Loop, and he's going to talk a little bit about uh, the relationship and then what that relationship brings to our APM customers. And he's eminently qualified to talk about this subject because he's an expert at Strong Loop, but additionally spent a significant amount of time at CA uh, and even goes back to the Wiley Technology days. So he's intimately familiar with the APM solution set. And with that, I'll turn it over to Shubra. Thank you, Paul. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is my first uh, broadcast in this community. Uh, I have been on this community in its early inception stages, so it's a, a nice coming back home <laughs> ceremony here. Um, just a quick question. Uh, I hope everybody is able to see my uh, or share, uh, slides here. Yes, I can see it, Shubra. 
So uh, what we'll do is I'm going to go through uh, some of the conceptual slides. Uh, then we'll take a short pause. We'll go into a demo mode, uh, see what the integration is all about. Uh, then we'll take another pause, and then we'll go into some upcoming future roadmap items. And as a community event, I prefer it to be very open uh, and, you know, having a two-way communication, very inquisitive, and we can have uh, as much discussion as needed. Uh, so with that being said, I'm going to start over. And uh, I believe there can be uh, different levels of understanding or skill sets uh, within uh, Node.js uh, within the community. So I'll assume that we are starting from scratch. And before I describe what Strong Loop does, or before I describe what uh, the relationship is all about, uh, why I am here to present today, I wanted to uh, go through uh, the story uh, of Node.js. Uh, so essentially what Node.js is doing today is it is powering what we know as the API economy. And the economy has suddenly shifted from being an app-driven uh, market to an API-driven market. And what is driving that uh, is the sheer number of clients and the sophistication of the clients. So your clients aren't web browsers anymore. Your clients aren't you know, just a simple mobile device anymore. Uh, what we are seeing here is what we know as uh, the explosion of omni-channel, uh, which, by the way, happens to be browsers, mobile devices, sensors, thermostats, you name it, right? Uh, and all of these devices or all these channels are necessarily sending a big payload of data as we experienced in the earlier days with Zoom, sending me a big payload of soap over the wire or a business mm -hmm. over the wire. We are now transmitting smaller, tinier payloads of data essentially in REST, uh, but even REST is being taken to a next level uh, looking over multiple optimization protocols of UDP, uh, as well as you know fragmenting the data in tinier bits uh, to serve these different types of front ends, which are now expecting what we call as events uh, instead of you know web pages or request response pairs. So how do we deal with this huge uh, increase in concurrency? So there's a new curve here. You know, as you go towards the explosion of web, staff, mobile, and IoT, uh, there is a sudden increase in the number of concurrent users. It's not that the population of Earth has suddenly increased or people are buying more stuff. It's simply that earlier, a user, Shubra, used to go to a web page and type in a URL and used to get a web page back. And that was one user session. Now, what has happened is as I go into fragmented apps, as I go into event-driven uh, applications, Shubra is now represented by 100 tiny Shubras, and each of them is making a tiny request. But what's happening on the back end is that the app server does not really know the difference between the payload. It still treats them as same number of users. So there is a huge spike in the concurrency. Yeah. But as we go towards this experience, the latency demand uh, is very tough. Uh, you know, as you go into the mobile and the IoT space, if you look at the latency curve, uh, you need to be, you know, in the millisecond or even nanosecond ranges. You can't really live away with two, three second response times anymore. That's going to kill your business. So who is propelling all this transformation? That happens to be Node.js. And that's why you should pay attention, and that's why the industry is paying attention here. Um, but why Node? How is it solving this problem? So Node essentially is server-side JavaScript. Uh, it was designed to run in a container called as the V8 uh, engine, uh, which is Google's container for essentially running Chrome or Chromium. But it can also run some .NET components in there. Uh, somebody in this uh, community ported V8 over to run on the server instead of the browser. And all of a sudden, you had JavaScript on the server side. Now, because you are not running in a patch JVM or a patch CLR system, and you don't really have to compile every bit of library, you are essentially interpreting the language. Uh, your runtime is, I would say, 10x to 10x faster. Uh, there is a saying in the JavaScript community that a JavaScript or a Node developer can write an app before uh, the other guy can boot up his IDE. <laughs> so essentially, 
know, load is much lighter. And uh, it's becoming perfect for APIs. There are some benchmarking numbers uh, from the PayPal, the eBay's, where they have done performance benchmarks, um, you know, against thread-based technologies, and Node has come in faster, and it is highly concurrent. And uh, here's the real guts of why Node is faster, why is it highly concurrent, right? If you look at the multi-threaded server, as we know it, right, all the Tomcats, the J-boxes, the WebLogic, WebSphere's, IIS, all of them work with thread pools. You have a constant uh, number to how much you can scale the thread pool. As requests come in, uh, you can allocate more threads, but if you have a slow backend, which is there in the real use case, your threads will be waiting. And you essentially have a case of blocking I.O. And if you have a thread pool of, say, 1026 uh, counts, and maybe you have, and all of the, those threads are busy, num thread number 1027 will wait. Uh, in Node.js, it took the classic asynchronous programming uh, construct and brought it to a language. So what happens here is all your requests are lined up uh, on the client side, and everything is processed by what we call as an event loop, which is a single-threaded process. Um, and the event loop essentially is a delegation master, or it's an orchestrator. Uh, it picks up every request, sends it off to a POSIX or an operating system thread, uh, keeps that route in memory, and as the operating system thread, uh, you know, now processes the back-end call uh, without having the front-end thread to block. Um, and the event loop then moves on, and then moves on. And as soon as the POSIX thread responds with the back-end I.O., uh, the response is served back by the event loop back to the user. So this is not new wine. This is essentially old wine in new bottle. This was done in the Windows NT days. It was used in MQ, all message-driven systems. But now this has been put into the server side as a language construct. And Java and other technologies have realized this. So you might be seeing in a few years, uh, you know, Java also emerging with an event-driven model. Uh, but guess what? Node has about like four years or five years of maturity in this space right now. Uh, so behind the curtain, uh, this is what it runs. Uh, under, under the hood, it's all C, C++. On top of it, there is a standard JavaScript library, and it runs on a, a porting uh, layer called LibUE, which makes it uh, portable across Windows, across Unix platforms. Uh, but essentially, it is event-driven, so uh, there are e-folders and uh, event folders which are listening on what, uh, various ports. Uh, and on the top layer, uh, there is a core library, which is distributed worldwide. And that core library, on top of it, uh, developers go and build what they call as modules. And if you look at the growth in Java, I'm going to just show you a statistic. Uh, Java has a uh, node, actually has the fastest growing uh, ecosystem of modules now. So uh, if you just do the stats uh, of the last year, uh, node is now at 118,000 modules, which actually is uh, bigger than the Java or the Ruby ecosystem. Uh, but again, that's a misleading number, uh, although, you know, uh, there is a lot of modules, they aren't really as high quality, but again, it has only been four and a half years since the technology was there. But this shows you the 10x growth of Node in the ecosystem, and these are numbers pulled from Maven Central or uh, Godoc or uh, NPMJS and, you know, uh, Ruby as well, right, so that, that you can actually uh, equate different technologies. So going back, uh, are there any use cases? So there are some public blogs. Uh, you should read up the blogs by Groupon. Uh, three major ones I want to point down. One was the cost of uh, infrastructure was cut down almost by 90% at customers like LinkedIn, uh, just because with the amount of scalability they had to handle. So if you are using the LinkedIn app, you are actually going through Node. If you are working with PayPal or eBay, you can rest assured your traffic is actually going through Node. Uh, they have they stood up an entire middleware and then they did a bake off and now have uh, decided to replace their entire middleware system with Node. And Groupon actually got a 50% improvement in page response times and also reduced their development effort because the same amount of functionality you could write in 30% less lines of code and with 40% fewer uh, resources as compared to a traditional technology. So who are the primary users? Uh, if anybody on this community works for one of these companies, 
uh, glad you are here. Uh, but if not, you should know that uh, Node is actually mainstream, and it's actually coming in, and the developers are bringing it, it in to build your next generation API. So if you are part of an operations team, uh, you will, uh, you are, you should be prepared to support the DevOps process for that. Okay. So at this point, I want to take a uh, very short pause and ask if there are any questions before I move forward. Uh, can, you Vanessa, quick... can you open up the audio questions? At this time, I would like to remind everyone, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We will pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Two brothers, no Q and A on the actual WebEx, just to let you know. Okay. There are no audio questions at this time. All right. Perfect. So we'll keep moving on. I hope you know that was not too much lecturing, but just wanted to get to the context. Uh, why are we all here, right? And why are, why is Node so exciting? Uh, so a little bit about Strong Loop, and I talk about the relationship, and then we'll get in, uh, right into uh, the integration. So uh, Strong Loop essentially uh, came out of the community. We maintain Node Core. We are the biggest contributors to Node Core. Uh, we also maintain frameworks like Loopback and Express, and about 100 open source modules. Um, and what this helps us do is give us a community outreach of about 66,000 developers, and we get about 2.3 million downloads along with Express, uh, you know, every month. Um, so what does uh, Strong Loop provide, uh, or what, what was the Strong Loop build? It's essentially building an iPaaS solution uh, for constructing APIs, which are solving these IoT, mobile, and the next generation web challenges. So if you look at, uh, these are the different phases, and we have different tooling to support that. Uh, all of the, starting with the composition phase, we looked into you know things like Express, Loopback, these frameworks, uh, integrating it with a variety of data connectors, the test and build utilities, there are uh, things to deploy and scale once you are done with writing your APIs. And then how do you secure and manage uh, these APIs? Uh, for that, we have an API gateway. Uh, but one of the sweet spots is performance monitoring, analytics, and metering. However, that being said, uh, we are not an APM vendor. Uh, however, we are an API platform which is being used by a a uh, huge amount of the community. So it made perfect sense for us to partner with a leader in the APM space, which happened to be CA. And um, so this is just, you know, if you, you can read about like what we do, you can go to our website, but essentially what we are trying to create, when I say an uh, iPad, you can think about it, if you were thinking 10 years back, this was when WebLogic hit the market and uh, you needed a server for hosting web apps, and now you need an ecosystem, uh, or I would not call it a server, that's why we are calling it an integration platform as a service uh, for you know hosting these next generation APIs, or building them, deploying them, monitoring them, and scaling them. Um, so this is, um, like now if you go down into how people build or use frameworks to write uh, Node.js apps, essentially a Node is being used as an API glue. So you will have people writing applications which are talking to multiple data sources on the backend, uh, including relational databases, you know, MySQL, Oracle, you name it, non-structured data sources like MongoDB, Cassandra, uh, talking with existing REST or even SOAP type interfaces, right? Or uh, maybe trying to consume data from proprietary services like uh, third-party APIs, SAP, Salesforce, and uh, so on. Um, so all these are generally consumed and uh, what are discovered using what we call as models. Uh, and with those models, now if you are familiar with the Hibernate architecture in Java or you know similar architectures in Python, uh, you can essentially do ORM. And with ORM, you can do relationship mapping and say, hey, get me convert these into lightweight JSON API, uh, which can be integrated seamlessly on the front end with mobile devices, JavaScript applications, uh, you know, IoT devices, uh, as long as they are following a common pattern and a common language construct, which happens to be JavaScript. Uh, so all of a sudden, there's this concept of isomorphic JavaScript. 
And, uh, you know, so this is what general people try to do. They are not trying to rip and replace Java or .NET. They are trying to integrate everything using Node because the ecosystem is so huge and it's so lightweight. So uh, we saw this trend, and uh, CA is a known partner in the um, leader in the APM space. And we said, okay, let's the uh, you know leader in the management space and the platform space try to collaborate together and see what we can do. So there are three collaboration areas we ca we came up with. One was creating an agent integration. Uh, an agent integration to us is very similar. Uh, I know a lot of you might be from the Java or the .NET background. If you're thinking about web logic, having a JMX layer, think about strong loop API platform uh, having a similar JMX layer. And that's called our strong agent. And what we have done with this is uh, we took an approach where uh, in APM 9.7, um, there was uh, a new EPA agent interface exposed with uh, where you can actually connect using REST API and post your metrics directly to an APM system, right? So we, in the first go, uh, we said, okay, let's take a stab at it. Let's uh, do an initial uh, round of uh, product beta and roll this out and roll out the first version of integration, which is based on this EP agent. As we mature uh, and the integration goes deeper and deeper, we keep adding more functionality. <laughs> uh, the second item for collaboration was training. And uh, Strong Group has been doing a lot of training across the community, particularly for Node.js. And CA has very graciously stepped up and uh, offered its uh, offices and offered itself in bringing a lot of enterprises uh, to the training curriculum. Uh, so you should be seeing some of that reference in the blogs. Um, and the third is all about Node.js community. Uh, so if you look at places like the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, there is a Node.js community of about 5,000 developers here. And there are hotspots all across every city. There are Node.js conferences and JavaScript conferences happening now. Uh, so CA has uh, gracefully stepped in and started sponsoring some of these community events, uh, meetups, uh, along with Strong Group. And it's a good way uh, to propagate the knowledge, bring up the learning curve, and uh, get people onboarded very, very quickly as they're coming in from different technologies like Ruby, Java, PHP. Uh, to learn JavaScript. Okay. So there's a blog entry. This was like uh, tweeted a few times. So if you have time, please feel free to read that. And uh, you know, if you are interested in one of the events, uh, please make sure you are there for the community events or the training. All right. So let's talk a little bit about the integration. So uh, installation-wise, Node developers download everything from uh, a package manager or a global registry called as NPM. So the way you will actually get this agent, there are multiple options. Uh, one way is to get it directly from NPM. However, if in your enterprise you cannot use Node Package Manager or you know you have internet uh, blockage policies or restrictions, then you can probably get a tarball uh, of the agent uh, from your CA representative as well. However, uh, generally in the world developer community, uh, you can just do an npm install dash dash global ca agent um, or if you want to uh, install that agent uh, and package it as part of your application build so that the monitoring agent gets embedded with the app uh, then you can add an option which is dash dash save uh, you know so npm install dash dash save ca dash agent and the third option is uh, again with dash dash save. However, in this case, uh, in the uh, earlier two cases, you don't have to change a single line of code anywhere in your application. You don't even have to add a reference to the agent. Um, you know, in the, in the Java land or the .NET land, you used to change class path parameters and so on. In JavaScript, you don't have to do all of that. Uh, however, if you do want to um, go down, there is a strictly API route of doing this. So in your main application program, in your startup program, on the very top, if you uh, add uh, these four lines, which is a required, it's essentially it's referring to your C agent, and then you can point at the EPA agent where the REST interface is running and the port of the EPA agent, and you can give it an app name. That's all you do there. So you stick it in into your main server uh, program, and that's it, and you're good to go. Uh, but if you don't want to go down this API route, just stick with the no code install, just a global install, you should be good enough. 
Okay. So let's go to a quick demo, and I have retained some screenshots for uh, further purposes. Uh, so let me go in here and open up our terminal window, which you would be surprised is uh, in the Node.js plan, people don't usually use a lot of IDEs. Very few people actually uh, use IDEs. Most of them use terminal windows or very lightweight uh, apps. Let me go ahead and open up a new one. Okay, and I'm going to actually create an app as we go. So I'm going to say SLC loopback, pull an example. So I'll start with an example application. And I'll say DA demo. Okay, I think I, let me do that one more time. So what you are seeing here is uh, this is just a utility to create apps and you know create APIs. Uh, but your Node developers would generally be pulling down what we call as modules uh, from Node.js ecosystem, or what uh, we also call as NPM. So as you are seeing these downloads, you should see a bunch of modules which are getting uh, downloaded from this global registry onto the user's machine. So right now is in the development stage, right? Okay, so I've got this application downloaded. And let's see. And I'm going to go into the CA underscore demo. And if I simply have to run this application, uh, folks would simply do node and then the main file, server, server.js. That's it. And you have an API here. This is a built app in node. You go in. Type that in. Okay, you have a bunch of APIs. You can, you can do some operations here. It's backed by a database, and you are getting all these REST API calls, all the data uh, coming from a relational DB back for this API. So very, very simple, right? So now, let's go in here and try to put an agent, or C agent, uh, to instrument that. So just to make sure, uh, I want to follow exactly the instruction and make sure they work because uh, guess what this was literally uh, released today um, so what I'm going to do is I have I'm going back to my terminal window and this time I'm going to say EP agent equals I have the EP agent, the 9.7 EP agent running somewhere on Amazon Cloud. And I'm going to give it the port, the listener port 8080. That's why it, it listens to on the web services interface. And I'm going to say CA-agent-run. And I could just say space dot, or I could say server server.js, doesn't matter. Um, so let's do that. Okay. And so it says I am connected and I have the app running now. But uh, where do I see the metrics? So let's go and pop open our uh, APM web view. And I'm looking at the investigator. I assume all of you are familiar with the web view. So I'm going to go in here. And this IP address is actually pointing to this example app. And you can see that I'm start. I will, I'm getting metrics right from the get-go. So installation-wise, it's slam dunk. <laughs> Nobody in Nodeland has any time for installing agents, doing a bunch of configurations, and so on, right? So now, uh, this is a simple application. doesn't really have a backend. So let's put a, a node again, as you know, is gluing everything together. So what we are going to do is we are going to put an actual database uh, behind this application and see if it makes any difference in uh, in the metrics. So I'm going to kill this process. And uh, right now you are seeing that I'm doing a control C and I'm running this. But uh, when you package your application into a build, 
then you can actually have the agent also part of the build. So when you actually deploy this application out, the agent will be running along with the deployment. Uh, but I'm showing you the developer experience when you first try this out. So this time, instead of running this application just standalone, I'm going to pass a parameter, say db equals my SQL, and uh, the agent run. Okay, and I'm going to throw some load at this application. So let's go to ca underscore demo, and I have a load generator script, uh, but I cannot run it. It needs to get some dependencies. So let's see what dependencies it needs. Okay, so let's say npm install request. Okay. npm install shuffle. So when you're doing npm install, essentially you are pulling down modules from the Node.js ecosystem. That's why people love Node, because you have an option of too many. Okay. I think with that we should be good. So let's put some load on this. There you go. So now let's go into our browser. Let's check out this app. Okay, let's see HTTP traffic coming in. Okay, there we go. So we just got some traffic hitting it. And all of a sudden, I see uh, MySQL coming in. I also see one tier other than the HTTP tiers. I'm looking at MySQL, uh, all the maximums, minimums, the averages, and everything going on. One of the very important metrics, though, is actually not the back end. You need to trace the front ends and the back ends and so on. Uh, but one of the key metrics is what we call as event loops. This is the event loop is very similar to the thread metrics in Java. So, and uh, what it does is these metrics are not just max in. Uh, the event loop average tells you what is the thread processing time on an average. Uh, the count tells you how many requests are in flight because it, it though it's running single threaded, so it's not spinning up multiple threads, but it does talk to multiple POSIX threads. So the count is very important from that perspective. The maximum and the minimum, uh, I would rather have uh, my eye on the maximum event loop time because it, if it crosses uh, the threshold of around, I would say 20, 30 milliseconds, uh, you know that you are going to have a blocked event loop. And a blocked event loop means that all your requests will start backing up now, and your response times will go through the roof, because uh, your event loop is the standard way of controlling all, uh, or uh, orchestrating all the requests coming to your Node.js application server, right? Uh, you have a variety of metrics uh, right there, you know, in terms of GC, E, HTTP metrics, concurrency, uh, HTTP connection count, different tiers. Uh, let me go ahead and now um, show you another one where I will actually go ahead and take the API route. So I'm go and uh, so if you want to physically instrument something, I have another project. is another way of instrumenting. So in the first one, we actually did not add a single uh, line to the application code. But if you wanted a lot of control, then what you can also do is you can include these uh, four lines, uh, which host is it pointing to which port into your main application program, which in this case happens to be app.js, and you should be good to go. So that's the second one. This application actually uh, is a very interesting one. It talks to other backends. So what I'm going to do is try to run this. And you can see that it has a Redis connection. It's talking to a Redis uh, in-memory database uh, backend, and the connection is failing. So I believe I need to start up the Redis server. So give me one second. Let's go there. Okay. Let's run this. Okay. And I'm going to now open.
from the top and get some load. And let's see the behavior on uh, our metrics now. So this app is actually called as my app, but in this one, we all of a sudden see there is a MongoDB backend, there's a MySQL backend, there's a Redis backend, um, and all of a sudden, each of these tiers, these are the backends that you are talking to. So in this first iteration of the integration, we have got you all uh, these, uh, I would say, average or aggregate metrics. I, in the next, in the further iteration, uh, we plan to get you individual uh, calls, which are like SQL calls, individual Redis calls, and so on. Uh, but again, as you go deeper and as you instrument more, uh, your metrics will expand. So let me go ahead and show you certain dashboards that I had put together uh, that might help you visualize this, visualize this whole piece uh, working hand in hand. So I'm just going to go ahead and log in. You might be even familiar with the workstation. I know a lot of people have switched to the web view, uh, but I still like the workstation. It's immensely powerful. Okay. And let's go ahead and open up a new console. And if you look at, so I'm getting all these metrics, but how do I stitch them all together? So just like, you know, a node is essentially playing API glue, right? So there will be simultaneous HTTP connections coming in. Uh, you will be branching it up to one or more data sources. You'll do some amount of middleware processing, some routing, some throttling. Uh, some conversion into ORM in this layer, right? Uh, so essentially, if I have to look at metrics in the middleware, the key metrics are event loops. The key metrics are garbage collection, uh, objects in the heap, or CPU utilization. If you're looking at the front end, in terms of API calls coming in, uh, key metrics you're looking for are first front end HTTP response times, connections, the slowest calls, the fastest calls, right? If you are really looking into backends uh, that you're talking to, and now there are multiple backends. I just have plugged them all together in one graph. I didn't have the time to break this into a MongoDB, Redis, MySQL. There could be multiple backends, right? Node users, like, I would say at least 20, 30 very popular backends. So the more you instrument it, the more you will get out of box, and you can create your own visualization, okay? So... Those are two very, very specific use cases, and you know, uh, you please feel free to go ahead and try this out. Uh, you should be having fun with this, and your developers would uh, absolutely love this. Okay. So what we did is we ran one example with the EP agent, uh, just as a runtime utility. The second one we ran as uh, a couple of lines of code, uh, and then you know, we, you run your application as normal. Uh, when you are running Pytorch, running it as a utility, you need to install this as die with a global flag so that it can be accessed by any program anywhere. Okay. All right. So uh, out of box, you are getting 24/7 Node.js monitoring. Um, you know, these are some screenshots. I want to spend a few minutes talking about R&D and milestones uh, that are being achieved in uh, Node.js performance land uh, because Node.js is relatively new. The tool sets around them are also relatively new. There aren't very much your tool sets around doing this, right? Uh, and what you have been seeing is pretty much state of art. But let me walk you through uh, some of what functionality we have in Strongloop as a platform. Uh, we may plan to, you know, get some of that into uh, your CA APM solution, uh, but you can also leverage it uh, just from a community perspective. So um, once you get beyond the 24-7 monitoring, in dev time, you might have to troubleshoot a lot of code to find out what we call as CPU bottlenecks. So in this land, uh, we use uh, V8 as a profiler of its own. Uh, and V8 is the container on which the node runs. And on top of that, there's a wrapper called as a node profiler. So Strongloop maintains that node profiler. And we have put this out in the open source. Uh, you can use this. Uh, you can essentially profile your, uh, your entire application call stack. Although every call is highly asynchronous, there isn't a thread, right? There's no thread local, like in Java. Uh, but with this profiling, you can grab the entire sequence, the call sequence, as well as you can break it down into the individual CPU time that you're spending in each and every function. 
so that, that's one uh, utility that has been developed in the past few months, very, very popular in the community. Uh, second one is memory leak diagnosis. So uh, very similar to what you have uh, in uh, Java, which is a heap dump, right? Uh, you don't have a heap dump in Node. Uh, so we wrote a utility uh, for generating heap dumps, and you can now do that programmatically, um, or you can even do that through a console. Uh, so we using our R console, we were able to point to a remote host and create a uh, Java, uh, a Node.js heap dump, and bring it back and analyze it. And when you are seeing the analysis, Google has been very, uh, I would say, responsive about this. And uh, we we base the profiling, all the CPU profiles and the heat profiles can be analyzed as is within Chrome DevTools. So the Chrome DevTools has very enhanced support. So what you're looking here is essentially your browser JavaScript console. And once you take a heat dump, you can load it in and you can go through every thread. You can look at uh, memory consumed, what are what, how much memory is being held back in your retainers, and even look down to the line of code where your your GC handles uh, are still wired in, and you are not able to release that memory back into uh, VH heap, right? And VH heap is uh, works slightly differently uh, than your normal JVM heap. Uh, you might have be hearing in short time some efforts from Oracle. They are trying to port over Node to run on the JVM, uh, but as of now, you know, Node.js runs on V8. Uh, another very innovative thing that's happening in this space is called dynamic instrumentation. Uh, I can actually show you an example. Is when you instrument, you can only instrument X number of packages. There are 118,000 packages uh, in the Node ecosystem, and there are 200 packages that get added every week. And if your developers are writing their own custom packages, they will be adding more and more modules. So how much can you instrument, right? There is, it's infinite. Uh, so what we have done is we are working on this utility where you can provide a line number or a package structure and dynamically hot patch, uh, you know, based on a regex pattern. Uh, so you can specify a line, num uh, a line level or you can specify, hey, this is a package, you know, very similar to uh, like if you are familiar with PBDs yeah, in uh, CAPM, you used to say any uh, uh, code that inherits from java.servlet.x, go and instrument that. That structure does not exist in Node, and not everybody uses dependent packages. So in this case, you are able to specify dependencies as well as you can just give line numbers and reject patterns. Anything that matches that uh, can uh, automatically get instrumented. So today, most APM vendors use a technology called as monkey patching, which is JavaScript method replacement. So whatever JavaScript function is running, uh, they instrument it, insert a probe, uh, get you some metrics, and report this out. However, with dynamic instrumentation, you can create your own metrics. You are not limited by how much instrumentation uh, is available uh, in the agent. So it gives you enormous flexibility and customization. So how would you go about doing that? Let me open up uh, a terminal window and show you some of that. Okay, so normally when you run this, uh, this is again, you know, alpha functionality hasn't been baked yet. It's still getting worked in the community. But uh, essentially we have a patch file, uh, which is a patch, it's a JSON file. And here you can say all the HTTP packages, or particularly one file here, or uh, maybe you know this is a sequence.js. You can specify line numbers. You can have only two types of uh, metrics. Either you have timers, which will give you response times, or you have incremental or decremental counters. Um, here, if I just run this, I am getting what we call as HTTP request, context requests, my SQL query calls, and all of those. So uh, I'm not going to try and run this live. But uh, on the metrics console, I'll show you something I had done earlier going crazy with this instrumentation. Uh, yeah, let me go ahead and show you an example. Uh, let's see. <laughs> so you can see here, we can go ahead and say, hey, you know what, uh, out of it, uh, all these objects, we can go ahead and instrument each and every object. 
you can say, okay, how many arguments are there? How many arrays are there? How many buffers are there? How many parsers are there? You can go ahead and instrument each and every, like, uh, MySQL coming in, MySQL going out. So how do I know, right? How do I interpret all of these calls? I interpret them because I exactly know which file number, which method uh, that I'm custom writing uh, gives me, uh, you know, which I need to instrument. So these are all custom metrics that you can create on the fly without having to wait for, uh, you know, the agent to be updated. It gives you enormous flexibility. And you can go ahead and, you know, instrument the heck out of it. Okay. Let's go back and talk about um, asynchronous transaction tracing. So every call is asynchronous. So the main challenge here is now how do I stitch it all together, right? We are so much used to transaction tracing and seeing the breakdown, upside down, wedding cake, uh, you know. So what you have today, which is realistically what APM can do, is endpoint tracing. So you can say, hey, something happens in the node world, uh, and node is essentially calling out every package, so I can somehow stick it together in context of, uh, in an execution context. Because if you get a request, that request can, uh, you know, it has an execution context, uh, which follows the delegation path. However, uh, a transaction can be a big transaction, and it could have multiple asynchronous requests coming in as part of that transaction. So it's very, very difficult to stitch that all together uh, in absence of a thread local. So one of the innovative things that's happening in the Node.js land is called as zones. And what zones lets you do is it implements a kind of a pseudo thread local around your JavaScript library. So uh, what happens is anytime a request comes in, uh, JavaScript or Node essentially returns you a pointer, a C++ pointer called as a callback. Uh, so here you can see that, and you know, this is one execution thread. This is another execution, I should not use the word thread. Let's say this is one execution context, and this is a second execution context. All, both of these are part of the same transaction. If uh, this write function in the first execution context errors out, uh, then what happens in Node land is, you can't really handle it, and the application crashes. And also, if you were to somehow gracefully handle it, you cannot trace it back to the originating transaction because you are out of context. The context is not preserved. There's nothing stitching it together. So uh, zones is a library where you can go ahead and actually zonify your application, implement a wrapper block uh, in and around your JavaScript file. And what it lets you do is things like, a proper error stack trace uh, or a proper transaction trace. So this is a unsolved problem. Uh, folks have used constructs like promises, uh, a variety of try-catch combinations, but zones, I would say, is very close to a try-catch finally implementation in Node.js. So if you, <laughs> you must be laughing out loud saying, hey, you know what, this is, Java did this 10 years back. Exactly, that's the point. Uh, 10 years back, uh, we were talking, you were probably talking to uh, folks on the mainframe side, convincing them uh, how great Java was. And I'm trying to do the same here 10 years later, convincing people again how great JavaScript is. But still, all these, con all these maturity concepts will slowly come in into the Node ecosystem. Okay? So uh, with that, uh, you know, I'm done with my presentation. I'll open it up uh, for questions. Uh, feel free to ask me anything around adoption, uh, the monitoring piece, uh, what's coming up, what are the community work happening in this space. Vanessa, can you open the live, please? Again, as a reminder, if you would like to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. We will pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Again, to ask a question, press star 1. There are no audio questions at this time. Okay. Um, Shukra, um, thanks a lot for your time, Shubra. Sorry. Um, as uh, I forgot to mention earlier, uh, we will definitely post this webcast on the community website in the videos. 
So it definitely feels good to check it out and review it. Um, if down the road, if you do have questions for Supercar, please uh, send those to caapmcommunity at gmail.com, and I'll definitely get them forwarded over to Shubra to get answered. Um, Shubra, once again, thanks for your time. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks, Melanie and, and Melissa and Keith for your time. Um, thanks, everybody else. Hope you guys have a great day and rest of the weekend. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. This does conclude today's conference call. You may now disconnect.